Our last speaker is Dr. Mari Pangestu. She is the current Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnership in the World Bank. She formerly served as Indonesian Minister of Trade and Minister for Tourism and Creative Economy, making her the first female Chinese Indonesian to hold a cabinet position. She was also one of the founding members of the WTO Forum in Indonesia. Dr. Mari served on the Leadership Council of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network, or SDSN, and is the pattern of the Southeast Asia and Indonesia SDSN. Please welcome Dr. Mari Pangestu. So, hi, Ibu Mari. My name is Kiara, and I'll be representing Permias National for today. So, mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. I'm sure, like, our audience really, really appreciate it. So, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kiara. <laughs> nice to virtually meet you, too. So, Ibu Mari, you've been an inspiration to so many Indonesian students. and we all really, really admire your amazing career journey. So we're just curious on like, what is the most important risk you took in your career? And why did you, uh, did, did you take that risk? <laughs> well, I'm not sure uh, what was maybe coming home to Indonesia. <laughs> uh, you know, I know a lot of students uh, after they study, they often ask, uh, I've often been asked, you know, should I go home or should I stay uh, in the U.S. or Australia or wherever they're studying? Uh, and and it is it is a scare. If you've been abroad for many years, it's quite scary to to actually consider going home because you haven't been home for a long time. So uh, I was in that position. Uh, you know, when I when I finished my uh, graduate degree. Uh, and I actually wanted to stay uh, in the U.S. I actually wanted to go and work for the World Bank. But then my father said, no, you have to go home. So I was really, really very apprehensive, actually, because I, have I had not lived in Indonesia for 20 years, you know. Uh, so I, uh, uh, but, you know, I, in the sense, I took the risk uh, to go home. Uh, and I guess it took me about, so this is the other advice I always give to those returning back to Indonesia. You have to give yourself time to readjust back uh, to your own country because you have been uh, away for some time. So I would say minimum two years because I think it took me two years to basically readjust back uh, to uh, living in Indonesia, being Indonesian, uh, and and even familiarizing myself with you know all kinds of, of uh, how you behave in Indonesia compared to how we, we are used to behaving uh, when we were going to school. So I, I guess I would say that's the the biggest risk I, I took in my career, and it was probably a, a well worthwhile risk because I ended up basically staying in my own country for the, the last three decades and and i feel like i feel very fulfilled in in um, in my career in my in my own country that's right i think that story really resonated with a lot of indonesian students especially with the like reverse culture shock you know yeah. going back to indo right. after staying here for so long so yeah so another question is like, based on your international experience, you know, collaborating with the global leaders uh, in World Bank, like how do other countries view Indonesia and what is one value that other country appreciates the most out of Indonesia? Hmm. Uh, no, that's a pretty tough question. Uh, I think I think Indonesia is a big country. Come on, you know, we are, uh, is it number the fourth? fourth largest country in the world, right? Uh, so population wise, we are the largest, a large country. And we have a, a country with, a, with the most, uh, pop, uh, the population with the highest number of uh, people with the Muslim religion. We are not an Islamic state, but we, we have the highest number of people with the Islamic religion. And we have uh, shown that, uh, you know, Islam, modernity, democracy can coexist. So Indonesia is seen quite positively in, in the world uh, stage. And we are also very rich in culture, very rich, very diverse and rich in culture. 
Um, and we have, um, we have shown that we can play a leadership role in Southeast Asia because we are the largest country in Southeast Asia. So Indonesia over the, you know, I would say since, since the, the mid 60s when you had kind of the, the Cold War at that time, Indonesia played a role in terms of uh, being a leader in Southeast Asia. By, if you are the largest country, you had better be, uh, you know, uh, coexist peacefully <laughs> with the others, not, not to, to be seen as a threat. So Indonesia has always played this kind of neutral role uh, in Southeast Asia uh, at, at what, what we call the big brother leadership, uh, but a leadership which is based not on power or, or, or force, but you know, based on peaceful coexistence. That has been kind of the hallmark of Indonesia. So Indonesia has seen quite pos very positively in that sense. And at least in my own experience, when I was representing Indonesia uh, in various international trade um, negotiations, we also always not just represent our national interests, but we often uh, represent the regional interests, the Southeast Asian interests, as well as developing country interests. Because we, we, we are normally, because we are a big country and we, we are considered uh, influential, we are always invited into the small group. You know, whenever you have these multilateral negotiations, uh, they always have small groups representing different regions, different types of countries. So we are normally in, in the negotiating room. So uh, we, we always feel like we are not just representing our own country, but uh, also our region and developing countries. And so I think, I think that's, I think Indonesia is seen very positively in, in, that, in that sense. Dante, thank you so much, Ivu. So you mentioned before that, you know, we pride ourselves on our value of democracy and like tolerance, but like oftentimes like intolerance and, you know, discrimination still exists in our country. So do you have any advice on like how can the younger generation of Indonesia like foster the importance of Bineka Tunggal Ika? I think it's the way we, we uh, must interact with uh, others you know we should not be um, in our own echo chamber <laughs> we need to reach out to uh, groups or people who are n not necessarily in our so-called comfort zone so i you know when especially for those uh, who, who studied abroad and then come home sometimes you feel uh, that you you just hang out or stick with the people who are similar to you uh, but that that um you know uh it, it, that that uh, probably disadvantages you because then you don't learn uh, about your own country. So I, I think for young people, it's important to gaul <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, you know, uh, try to to be involved in in associations or or organizations. Uh, which will bring you to meet uh, all kinds of people in Indonesia because I think Indonesia is is a country which which um, has uh, have very strong uh, has shown in the in the in historically uh, shown uh, a high degree of tolerance uh, either between religion or or between uh, ethnicity you know there of course the, there there are uh, incidents there is uh, still um, discrimination there is still uh, some kind of uh, uh, increase in intolerance but i think by and large we should feel lucky that by and large, Indonesia, I would say, is still a, a very tolerant country. I mean, I grew up, I would say, in in a in a you know in a, in, in Indonesia, which was uh, very very tolerant. We would, uh, you know, in in our neighborhood, uh, we celebrate Christmas. Then our neighbors come, and then when our neighbors celebrate Lebaran, we go and visit uh, our neighbor. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to think that Indonesia, by and large, is still in that in 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 that direction. So we need. We, all of us need to, uh, 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 what do you call it, protect that, that value <clears throat> and that positive, um, the positive uh, value that is, uh, I would say, the strength of Indonesia because Indonesia is so diverse. If we didn't have uh, tolerance, you know, we would have, like in, in <clears throat> I went through the reform movement in 98 and you you are you probably were not born yet no, yeah i wasn't born yet <laughs> so uh at that time uh you know ussr had broken up as a country when they went to, uh, to democracy so everybody was actually predict predicting that indonesia would be split up as a country would be balkanized that's the kind of term 
Uh, and I remember some of us were, you know, saying, no, we are, we are stronger than that. We are, we have strong natural resilience. And it's true, Indonesia didn't break up. You know, Indonesia actually stayed very together all throughout the, you know, the years of going towards democracy. And we should be proud of that uh, because everybody was predicting that in 98 that we would just break up as a country, but we didn't. So there are many instances where Indonesia um, has gone through challenges, but it has been resilient. And a part of the resilience, I think, is because uh, there is a lot of uh, tolerance, there is a lot of respect. And I would say the national unity is, is quite strong. You know, despite uh, what what we think are are signs of weak, a signs of maybe deterioration, but I would say it's still strong, and it's up to us, up to you, the young generation, to maintain it. You know, be proud to be Indonesian, and Indonesian in the in the true sense of the word, uh, not just in your circle, but in in your wider wider circle to embrace uh, all that's wonderful about Indonesia. That's right. And as a younger generation, we really need to embody the value of Bineka Tunggal Ika, right, Ibu? Yes. Yeah. That's nice. So, Ibu, um, we know that investing in women's economic empowerment sets a direct path towards like gender equality and also like inclusive economic growth. So, how can we each make a difference and advance the equality and empowerment of Indonesian women? Uh, well, I think you have to you have to look at it from I would say uh, even from before birth all the way uh, to to someone's career path. Uh, if you're talking about the kind of the professional or political career path, so uh, uh, girls, uh, you know, even before they are born, they should be given the right, uh, the equal equal access to nutrition, equal access to education. Uh, all, and then, you know, all throughout their life, they should be given equal access to whatever boys are given. Uh, because otherwise, basically, you are, uh, you as an, eco uh, the economy is actually not benefiting because you are not uh, fully utilizing 50% uh, of your um, human capital. Uh, so I, 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 I'm a great believer in, you know, equal access all the way even before you are born, you know, other, because we have studies to show that uh, if uh, even before you are born, if you are somehow or rather not getting the right nutrition, it's going to affect you for the rest of your life because cognitively you don't develop as much, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Education is the same. There's many studies that show that if you give girls education, actually you will, it will lead you to a reduction in poverty because girls uh, will go, go uh, grow up to uh, become productive uh, worker, productive female, and they will tend to look after children, look after the family and, and uh, have a better next generation. So this is empirical, uh, empirically, empirically shown, even for access to credit. Uh, you know, small, starting from the very micro credit. Uh, women, uh, there's less uh, non-performing loan uh, with women. So uh, we, we need to encourage more uh, women entrepreneurs. We need to give them access, equal access to men or even a more affirmative access because, uh, because uh, we, uh, a lot of women entrepreneurs, especially when they've just started, uh, they, they have a confidence problem. So they, they need to be uh, empowered uh, and, and, and uh, given a, a, affirmative action. Uh, and then, you know, throughout the career of a woman, uh, also um, uh, studies have shown that when you enter the workforce, it's about 50-50. Uh, but then as you move up the career ladder, uh, it becomes less and less women. I think at the top management position for Indonesia, it's about 8%. Uh, and you know, so the, for many reasons, family reasons, uh, or career choices, or cultural. So uh, companies need to also uh, have policies that allow women to uh, to to balance uh, both uh, family as well as work. The same way you would actually uh, give to men, you know, like in 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 I think in the World Bank, yeah, and and many other uh, kind of. Uh, international corporations, you, you don't just get maternity leave, but you also get uh, paternity leave, right? So uh, it's both uh, father and mother uh, can get leave uh, when they have a child uh, that's who, who is born, right? So I think uh, these are just some examples of, of how uh, it, it should happen. And I would say that um, I wouldn't be here uh, 
with my uh, career if uh, my father had not given equal access uh, to to education for uh, I had two brothers, uh, uh, but he gave equal access uh, for all his children, despite my mother's uh, protest. My mother didn't want me to to study uh, too high. That was her words. She's you know, and and the reason is very traditional. I know she's she did it because she's she is looking out. At, at least she thought she's looking out for my interest. She basically told me, if you study, uh, if you are too smart and you study to, get, to have your PhD, nobody's going to marry you. <laughs> and, but then my father actually was the one who, um, who uh, defended me and, and said, she has the right to, to do whatever she wants. If she wants to study more, you should let her study more. So and up, uh, I did end up getting a PhD and I did end up getting married. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not, it, it, it's just life's choices, but uh, 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 women, uh, girls, uh, women should be given the, the, the equal opportunity because uh, this is the only way we can get a balance in the, you know, it's, it's for, for economic reasons. It's not just for, um, uh, what do you call it, equality and fairness. It is about uh, having a more productive workforce because 50% uh, of your human capital are women. So you should invest equally in, in women and men. That's, that's a very amazing story. And I think it, very, it resonated a lot with a lot of Indonesian women, you know, um, a lot of us, you know, would often be told that, you know, not to get our education too high or, you know, <laughs> just like focus on like, for example, uh, domestic things. But I think like, you know, the era is really moving forward right now. And hopefully the younger generation can, you know, keep on fostering that value of equality. So we have a couple of questions from our viewers. Um, so one of our viewers um, is asking, what is your most memorable experience while going to school in the U.S.? Hmm. <laughs> mm, that's my most memorable experience. I guess being a TA, I was, um, you know, uh, I, I basically worked my way. Uh, when I was doing my graduate degree, I basically didn't uh, ask for any money from my parents. So I either got a scholarship or I would work as a teaching assistant or a research assistant all throughout my, my graduate career. And being a teaching assistant uh, was really a very interesting experience for me because, you know, I was dealing with first year, second year uh, American, a lot of uh, American students. And they were like sometimes twice as big, you know, in height, twice as big as me. Uh, and, you know, Americans have really terrible, maybe I shouldn't say this, but they have terrible <laughs> handwriting, right? So whenever they write the, the problem sets, the, ter the writing is always so terrible. Uh, and I had so much, I had so much fun in a way, uh, you know, sort of dealing with these first year and second year students. Uh, and some of them, they, you know, you, you know exactly, uh, you know, I had office hours and then uh, when there's going to be a quiz or when there's going to be a midterm, you'd see them kind of lining up outside of your office. And they're, sometimes they're like, come up with sob story and sometimes they come with chocolate chip cookies. You know? <laughs> uh, I think it's memorable because, uh, you know, it, it gave me like a window into, into American culture and, you know, American kids at that 18, 19 year old uh, age. And, you know, I, I, I would say I was kind of the, one of the favorite TAs because I guess I gave them a lot of time and I treated them as like, okay, you know, you need help. Okay, come in, come and see me. Even sometimes I would extend my office hours because I cared, I cared for them, right? Uh, and maybe that's not usual for them. And so I, I, I had a great time uh, being, being a TA and interacting uh, with these uh, students um, and uh, gave me like a, a window uh, to American culture. And I also found that uh, as a TA, because we were so-called foreign students, they, they made us take a class in uh, public speaking because they, they thought that, you know, we need to learn how to you know, to, to, to communicate uh, with our students. So I, 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 you know, because it was a requirement, I took a class, a one, one quarter class in public speaking. But I, I thought it was one of the best uh, experiences that, that taught me, I think, to become a, a much better public speaker that, that you know, eventually I, I did 
I think I did become a pretty good public speaker because it was not something that I had never never thought about, you know. And um, and so uh, uh, I, what I, was, what, what I think my point is that if you're still if you're still a student studying, you should take classes that are not in your in your usual usual in, in your major. You know, take take fun classes, take uh, learning classes. So if you look at my CV when I was doing PhD, you will find public speaking. You will find I went to UC Davis. It's one of the best wine schools in in the world. We, you take a class for wine tasting, <laughs> and I took PE classes uh, for tennis. Right. Oh. Uh, I think for three years. So uh, and it was fun, and you meet all kinds of people who are not your normal, you know, classmates, you, you meet people outside of your, your. so I, I think, I, I think uh, US education is so wonderful because you have so many choices, right? Uh, you can take so many classes that are not in, in your major and you can, uh, uh, there is so much opportunity to learn uh, in the US uh, beyond, beyond your major and, and you, should, you should really take advantage of it including if you have opportunity like year abroad or internship uh, you know, U.S. U.S. Uh, universities are so wonderful in that regard. That's so just explore as much as possible, yeah. and that's amazing, Ibu. So uh, I think we have one last question from our viewers. Is uh, she said, "I heard that you love to dive. So where is your favorite <laughs> dive spot in Indonesia?" Uh, has to be Raja Ampat by far. You know, uh, I, uh, as some people said, you should not dive. Di you should dive other places first before you dive Raja Ampat, because once you go to Raja Ampat, everything else pales. And and they're absolutely right. You know, I've been to Raja Ampat three times, and every time it's just been so wonderful. Why is it so wonderful? Because it's uh, so pristine. You know, it's it's very very unpolluted, uh, and therefore this the life under the sea and and the and the fish and the corals they're just so big so vibrant that it's no it's it's so different from any other place uh in 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 the world i would say uh or or indonesia i mean i i've been i i did dive uh, many places in indonesia and each one of them are actually special so it's really hard to say that raja Ampat, uh is my favorite but uh, i would say raja Ampat is my favorite my second favorite is probably barau um uh it's in in kalimantan uh what is that place called? It's where the giant turtles are, the giant green turtles. So you are you are diving and you are basically you know in the middle of all these giant turtles and they're like when you look to your left there's a there's a big turtle. You look to your right there's a big turtle also looking at you, right? So uh, those were some of the the wonderful moments in diving. And Indonesia is is just so wonderful uh, for diving. It's it's another um, another aspect of our diversity that uh, we have so many. Um, you know, we are, we are diverse in culture as well as in uh, ecosystem, in, in the nature, and, and we are just, uh, you know, we are just so blessed, you know, and I think the best job I had in my life is to become Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy. It was the best job uh, ever, you know, it's really, um, it really made me appreciate um, Indonesia, you know, above land and below water. Uh, it's just so, you would be so amazed uh, at, at the, the richness of Indonesia on, on, on all, all, all aspects. So we should be, we should be proud to be Indonesian and we should be really, um, as young people, you should uh, travel as much as possible in Indonesia itself and, and learn about Indonesia. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's one of the most unique countries in the world. Thank you. That sounds really amazing. So we're just gonna close it with one last question. So Ibu Mari, what does Indonesia mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does Indonesia mean uh, to me? Uh, Tanah Air. It's my it's my homeland. I would never live anywhere else. I mean, I, I would, I'm working here now in the U.S., but I don't think I would live anywhere else except in my Tanah Air. I, uh, I, I told you I came back from uh, living 20 years abroad and came back. And after my last three decades in Indonesia, I, I think Indonesia is, there's no other place like home, like Indonesia. Uh, and uh, we are now, what, 75 years? Is, it, is this the 75th year of our independence? Is that right? 
did I get the numbers right? Yes, 45. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's this is our we have uh, uh, this is Hari Kemerdekaan 17 Agustus. Uh, it is always uh, a proud. I always enjoyed 17th of August, especially when we, I be, I was minister. Uh, every 17th of August, we would have a celebration in the palace, and part of the celebration is actually seeing all the the different provinces come, and they would they would perform uh, in front of us, and then we would all sing uh, all the. Uh, you know, Indonesia Raya, uh, 17 Agustus, all the all the wonderful lagu-lagu uh, perjuangan, yeah. And it always made me uh, very terharu, yeah. Very, you, can, you can always cry when you see when you hear those songs. It's it's amazing. You know, every time I sing Indonesia Raya, I I my goosebumps. I always have goosebumps. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether any of you young people have that same feeling, but. Um, maybe you have to experience it in 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 a, in a situation where everybody's singing live, right? Uh, and, and to to appreciate it, and and that makes me proud to be Indonesian. So, Indonesia tanah airku yang aku cintai. That's really amazing, Ibu. So thank you so much, Ibu Mari, for being okay. here, and thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it, and I'm sure our viewers gain a lot of insight out of this talk so thank okay. you so much selamat 17 agustus everybody all right thank you so much ibu uh,